Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the South Atlantic Conference live Sabbath school. And we're just happy to be here. Before we go any further, there are some, some announcements we want to make or some congratulations. We want to thank our pastor that's with us today, Pastor Daryl Palmas. Congratulations on your master's thank from you, Oakwood University. I appreciate it, man. No problem, no problem. And also online with us, we have Pastor Monty Newbill, who also is newly minted from the master's program at Urban Ministry from Oakwood University. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Good to be here. Thanks awesome. so much. Class, congratulations mate. to you too, Doc. Awesome. Oh, yeah, thank you very because much. Because we give our congratulations. A master's degree was no, you know, small feat, but that doctor looks real good. And we got the doctor <laughs> in the building right here in John Scania. Amen. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Also with us joining us virtually will be Daryl Howard and Pastor Joel Bohannon. You guys want to say welcome. Welcome, man. Hello, it's a joy everybody. to be joy hey. to be a part of Sabbath School once again. And we're excited what God is gonna do today. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I just wanna say hello, praise God. Amen, amen. We have Good a wonderful Georgia. Sabbath School lesson for this morning. We're gonna go dive straight into it where we're talking, continue to talk about Abraham. And this week we're studying the covenant with Abraham. Why don't we go ahead and start with Saturday's lesson. On Saturday's lesson, it starts out with memory text, but Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Here we find Abraham in a situation, Elder Palmas, where he is in a situation where he's been given a promise and he's made a covenant with God. But he yeah. says, I have no I don't. How am I going to this promise going to be fulfilled yeah. uh, in my life? Any comments on that? Any questions you can come from that? You know, a lot of times we count ourselves out yeah. from the promise. You know, we say we're too old, we're too young. We don't, we just talked about education. I don't have the right degrees mm -hmm. and letters behind my name. I live in the wrong neighborhood. Maybe I'm from the, uh, uh, the wrong family, etc. Mm -hmm. But the encouraging word for me, um, Dr. Sconiers, man, is that if God promises you something, mm -hmm. that promise will come to pass. That's right. And it doesn't matter the circumstances <clears throat> in your life at the time or what you believe disqualifies you from the blessing or from the promise. If God said it, that settles it. That's right. That's right. We got to realize that if God says it, that settles it. No matter how far off you may be from it, no matter how it doesn't look like it's going to come to pass, whenever God makes a promise to you, you can be sure that it's going to come to pass. We see right now that even in the midst of him being childless, even in the midst of him, uh, you know, even trying to figure out how this is going to come past, God has a plan. It's not man's plan. It's not, not what anyone is thinking, but God still has a plan. Pastor Newbill, Pastor Howard, Pastor Bohannon, have anything to add to that? Yeah, one of the things that I continue to be reminded is uh, God has this very unique way of giving us free will, but still being in control of our life. He already knows what the plan is. He knows what he wants to do in us. He knows what he wants to do for us, but he still gives us this opportunity of free will. And one of the things that it seems as, as if that he's let them have free will, but he's already, he already has a plan for each one of the individuals in our lesson this week. Um, he already has plans for them. And whether they accept it or not, his plans are gonna be Super, are going to supersede what our plans is. And I think that's a lesson for us today that if we just latch on to his plans and, and follow, we can trust him. And this is for me in a constant example that even though Abraham messed up, God continued to dwell with him and have patience with him. And I think that's something that we can take from um, the lesson in totality of the whole week for us now. Definitely. When I reflect on this, you know, there are many times in which God has, uh, you know, uh, utilized an individual and it seemed as if uh, it wasn't going to come to pass. What God has promised an individual wasn't going to come to pass. But praise God, he is faithful. And I just want to echo that as much as possible, that God is faithful. We can trust in God. Brother B. L. B. Hennon, Bo Hennon. Well, there, there's a song. Um, it states uh, what God has for me. Yes, it is for me. Um, I know without a doubt that he'll bring me out what mm -hmm. God has for me. It is for me. And I'm so glad that God has a, a very specific plan for each of our lives. We call it the plan of salvation. Mm. But God has a way of, of, of leading us to the rock that is higher than I. So I'm just so thankful that we have this, this great plan, this great God who is watching over us and leading us and guiding us despite 
some of the choices that we have made. Amen. I'm just so thankful that he he's got us covered. Amen. 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 And that kind of leads us into, you know, Sunday's lesson where it talks about the faith of Abraham. Specifically, Abraham is considered the father of the faithful. He's considered an individual who has a, an abundance amount of faith. But yet we, we see here that he's questioned God. He's asking God, hey, how is this going to come about? And then we see God respond to Abraham's concerns. Right. He says in, in Genesis chapter 15, he says, look, uh, you're going to have a son. It's not going to be an heir and, and that heir is going to fulfill the promise. But you are going to have a son through your own body. And that and right now that just shows that not only uh, does Abraham have a concern, not only is he there, but he's being faithful and following the promises of God. Out of promise. Anything on that? You know, it, I can just imagine Abraham saying to, and I know we're going to get into this in a little bit, but him saying, listen, I'm so old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? and, 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 and here's the crazy part. Now, we know in, in those days, they lived long, right? Longer than we have now. Yes. The Bible tells us now three score and 10, mm -hmm. right? But they was living 100, 200, you know, Methuselah, 969, something like that, mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about folks who are living old, but yet biologically, at like you're not supposed to have kids after a certain age right right and and i can just imagine abraham saying to himself god i hear your promise but going back to what i said a minute ago while i hear what you're saying i see different yes what i see what i know in me just just within me mm -hmm. i'm disqualified from this that's right that's you know right. what i mean that's so right. Imagine now if God tells you to do something uh, and, and because you're disqualifying yourself, now you start to try to manipulate and do certain things mm -hmm. to bring the promise to pass. Yeah. But what I love about God's word is we don't have to help God out. Exactly. Right. If God said it again, that settles it. And he's going to ensure that it happens because God is not somebody that can lie. Yeah. And I, what I like about it is that it actually says that God's fulfillment of his promises yeah. is not based upon our own righteousness. Yeah. or what we work, right? Yeah. We don't have to work anything out. Yeah. God says, look, I got a promise for you. It is a promise that I have specifically for you, specifically for your life. And you, when you follow my will, you don't have to work it out. It's not even, it's not even built upon uh, 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 you know, your, your own righteousness, but just because I'm a good God. Dr. Scott, here's what's crazy about it. I love what Pastor Bohannon just said in that every one of us has a promise of salvation, mm -hmm. but we all have a specific promise as well. Yeah. Right. So there's a general promise that we all get to partake in, but there's something specific for us. And I just want to encourage somebody who's watching right now via whatever platform you're on. I want to let you know that there is a specific plan for your life. There is a specific promise that God has for your life. And I don't want you to, to disqualify yourself. I don't want you to discredit yourself. You probably aren't worth it. That's cool. But guess what? God says you are worth it because he spoke that thing to you. I don't know how long ago he spoke it to you, but he spoke it. And if he said it, that what? You can come to pass, sir. It will come to yes. pass. I was, and I was, good morning again, everyone. I, I like that concept of dealing with the promise. One of the things it looks at that we have to understand is that uh, the promise is a level of guarantee, but it's also about a relationship. Mm. So that Abraham had a responsibility his responsibility was to accept what God was going to do mm -hmm. versus trying to help God. Amen. And I think in our Christian journey, many of us as Christians, we try to help God and by saying, okay, I'm going to position myself so that that way maybe I can get part of the credit for this blessing. But it's all God all the time. Amen. That's Amen. Good. As we move further down good in word. Sunday's lesson, what happens is that we see that there is a sacrifice that's set up, right? We see that, you know, there is some animal parts that are split and we see that, you know, God, you know, the representing God walks through those animal pieces. Yeah. And kind of what that's kind of and what that in, entails, this is a, this is something from the ancient times in which we see that two individuals that are part of a covenant will walk in between those pieces. And when they walked in between those pieces, it was a sign of rather than break this covenant I have with, with well, we covenant we have with each other, I would rather be torn apart like these animal pieces. But notice Abraham did not have to what make that walk in between those covenant pieces. Notice it was God who took that walk, meaning that God is going to be faithful. Be honest, I, see, I see you there shaking your head there. Go ahead, brother. I know you got something to say. Go ahead. I was just simply saying that's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham didn't have to walk through it himself. That's right. That's a powerful word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And I wonder if we, if we sometimes we get that little messed up, Elder Buchanan, because I sometimes I look at that. Sometimes we think we are the ones walking through it. Right. We think we are the one that are holding up our end of the covenant. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that's where we get, we get it wrong. You know, God has made a promise to us and we just need to accept that promise. Elder Howard made a special had a, a, a moment there when he said sometimes we just got to accept it mm-hmm. and move forward on. You know, also, I, I think about the fact of, you know, sometimes um, Pastor uh, Thomas mentioned that we try to help God. But mm. then there's also times that we try to discount God, meaning he He tells us we have a promise. But then we look at it and, and say, well, we're not worth it. We we're not good enough. We try to validate the the opposite of what God is trying to do. And there's some people that have done well in their life to discredit what God is trying to give you in the promise. Mm. He's promised you something and and you continue to negate what he's promising you. And the truth is we have to we have to change our mentality with it. Mm-hmm. Like the truth is there's nothing that could ever take away the promises or the blessings that God has for us. There's nothing that we can do and there's nothing that Satan can do to take away what God wants to give us as a promise or a blessing. But Satan surely can distract us mm. in a way where we do not recognize what it is that God is trying to do. That's right. And in that, that is a lot of people's downfall. They, they're so mesmerized at their um, insignificance in their life, in their mind, that they're not able to embrace what God is trying to do with, do with them. Um, The other thing is, I think in this lesson, all the way from Saturday to, I think this lesson has been broken up in in a couple quick pieces. But what we've learned is every decision that Abraham and uh, Abram and Abraham made, um, it it ended up following him for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Every decision that he came, whether he went left or right, it followed him. And I think it's a good example that the things that we do have both a positive impact and also a negative impact in our life. And sometimes there's others that are blessed or in a sense harmed because we're not walking where we should be walking. Yes, yes. You know what, Doc, uh, Pastor Newville, uh, I love what you said in terms of there's nothing we can do to stop the blessing, Mm -hmm. right? But I just had a question for us, uh, and, and maybe there's somebody watching right now that may have the same question. While we can't stop it, is it possible that we can delay it, mm, mm. right? Mm. We love to say delay does not deny, right? But mm. sometimes, if we're honest, I'm just speaking my own life. I believe that the master's degree that we just talked about, I, I should have had that over 20 years ago. Mm. But there were some things in my life that I did. Now, granted, I, I, I didn't do it on purpose, <laughs> but there were some things that I did, some decisions that I've made that have, as you just said, Pastor Newville, have followed me all these years mm. that I believe has delayed the blessing. Mm. Now, I'm grateful that delay is not denied, but could it be that God gives you something and tells you what to do and you don't do that thing just like he says it or you make a bad choice here and there along the way? I don't know. Just trying to spark some dialogue here that actually delays the promise from happening. Mm. I think. Well, can I chime? In? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to chime in and just uh, simply uh, quote the psalmist David when he says, "Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life." That's good. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. You know, I've heard preachers uh, uh, preach this point and simply say that goodness and mercy are chasing me. Mm. It, God is literally chasing me to 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 the blessing. Mm. Um, he's chasing after me to get. Me. The blessing to me and so god had made the promise um to abraham but abraham in his impatience yes he made some choices Mm -hmm. but god was still chasing after him because god still wanted to fulfill the covenant promises that he had not only made to abraham but also to to adam so god's plan is triumphant Mm -hmm. in despite our 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 failures and in spite of our weakness in our weakness his strength is made perfect amen. and in the fullness of time mm-hmm. those blessings shall come amen so that's good word amen. can i say two things to that yeah go ahead um one i think that 
to us, it may be a delay, mm. but to God, it may be on time. Amen. Oh, that's a word. Because even though, like I said earlier, he gives us free will, mm -hmm. but ultimately what he wants done is going to be done. Mm. Right? And so I think that we are protected. We are comforted. We are <laughs> shielded by those twins, grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. And and it's the, it's the idea that in many of our lives, we are um, um, saved by grace and we're spared by mercy. That's why mm -hmm. we're able to do a lot of things that we do because we're, we're, we end up being saved. Grace saves us and mercy spares us. Mm -hmm. That's good. Definitely, definitely. As we move towards the end of Sunday's lesson, moving to Monday, I just want to make this point that the, the Sabbath school lesson definitely wants to focus, have you focus that, um, you know, our, our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags, right? So we, we need to stop counting up the good things that we do, you know, and stop as if we're storing stuff in a bank, right? We want to focus on the fact that this, this promise that, that we receive from God is a promise that God will provide. It's not based upon our righteousness or our good works. Let's go ahead and move directly into Monday's left when it talks about Abraham's doubts, Abraham's doubt. We see here that uh, Abraham had an issue. Amen. Abraham was was there. He had got a, a, had confirmed there's going to that this this son, this promise is going to take place through his own body. But then he kind of jumped the gun a little bit and he went and actually took Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. And uh, and, and it still doesn't deter the promise. But we see that, that this actually causes an issue in his household. Dr. Pomp, anything on that? Yeah, you know what? There is so much in this particular lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we're short on time, and I want to get to uh, Pastor Bohanna's thoughts on this. But, man, listen, just like the lesson is titled, God will provide. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, God is going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I know we're coming up on, I, I keep referencing this because this is the freshest thing on my mind, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> we're, we're in this graduation season and there's some of you trying to figure out how you're going to pay your bill. We're, we're coming up on the first of the month, somebody mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to, how to pay rent. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. This is what the Bible says, mm -hmm. nor is he begging bread. So at the end of the day, God is going to make a way. It may not be the way that you were going to work it out, but that's what makes it a miracle. Because if you could do it in your own strength and in your own way with your own resources, you wouldn't need God. Right. But God is saying to us today, not only did I give you the promise, uh, but I'm going to work that thing out how I choose to work that thing out. Pastor Bohannon, what do you have to say about Monday's lesson, man of God? Amen. Amen. Um, there was just one one. There's many points in this uh, in this Monday's lesson. But the portion that I would like to share is. Um, here in the second, I guess, paragraph where it says when, when Isaac asked about a sacrificial animal, um, Abraham's response was God will provide himself a lamb. Mm -hmm. And then it says the verb provide, yere lo, is used in a way that can mean provide himself or literally see himself. Um, so, so I remember just briefly when I left, left home, I was chasing after Jesus not realizing that Jesus was chasing after me. And as I was chasing after Jesus, looking at the things that I would need as I was journeying down this road, um, Jesus r keeps reminding me that what I need is him. Um, he is the source. He is the provider. He is the, he is my strength. And so um, we oftentimes get caught up in the rigmarole of life, not realizing that the answers to all of our questions and the solution all of our problems are wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in what God provided. And yes, God can't provide money, but what you really need is God to provide Jesus. Because mm. if you get Jesus, hello somebody, he'll take <laughs> care of the money situation. Okay. Um, so I, I just wanted to hang my hat on the, um, the song where it says, you are the source of my strength. Mm. You are the strength of my life. Jesus is, has been provided for us mm. and that's all we need that's right to encounter not just the christ of the bible but the resurrected christ that lives today amen uh, that's 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 the word 
Amen. And that's an awesome comment. I think the thing that I look at when I look at this story is that, as you guys have already mentioned, that God still provides, right? We know that God, that Jesus is our provision. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I see here is that even when Abraham decides to take Hagar and take things into his own hands, God still provides, as you just mentioned. And one of the things that kind of got me is that, um, and the lesson uh, alludes to this, is that there are some, some there's, a, there's, a, there's a remnant there, or at least a referral there, a reflection on what took place in the garden with Adam and Eve that's taking place here now with Abraham and, and Sarah when they decide to come, and they have this complaint, this plan, and they decide to give, uh, you know, uh, Sarah's uh, handmaiden, Hagar to Abraham. We see them trying to work things out on their own, right? We see them trying to facilitate God's promises through their own means. And the one thing that we want to make sure that we're doing is we understand that we allow God to work his stuff out and for us to just follow his will. And the Sabbath school lesson makes a point there that even though there's a child that's born, their child is, is his name is going to be Ishmael. But then God comes to Hagar and says, look, you know, um, even though this may not have been my plan, I'm still going to be a blessing on the mistake that has taken place. Right. Yeah. Isn't that something we, we can move out in our own ways. We can do things the way we want to do it. But God still says, look, I'm, I'm going to take this mistake and I'm going to turn it into a blessing yeah. somehow. Yeah. You know, hey, but, don't don't get too ahead. That's Thursday's lesson. That's Thursday's lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I like, can I say something? Um, I like what um, Pastor Bohanna said about that statement. Mm. And it applies to us even now that that not only can God be the substitution. Mm. Or, no, I'm sorry. Not only can God provide the substitution. But it's almost like a foreshadowing yeah. of what he was going to do for us in taking the place of sin on the cross. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like how I, I, there's something else that came in it, too, where I think it mentioned in Hebrews where, you know, there's a lot of people that they, they, they try to assume how Abraham may have felt when he was told to sacrifice his son, mm -hmm. his only son. And, and you realize um, all, all the promises hinges on this one son. Yes. Not not the mistake, not the one that was out of the will of God, but every promise that God gave to Abraham, it's foundational in his son, Isaac. Yes. He can't be the father of many nations if Isaac isn't born. Hmm. Uh, and therefore, I, I get the picture that in Hebrews, it says that or it gives the idea that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac mm. with every faithful belief that God will resurrect him to ensure that the promise is true. Mm. Like you gotta think about think about the type of faith that is. That that has mm -hmm. to be uh true faith it has to be general uh, uh genuine faith that even though god is telling me to sacrifice my son i have faith that that my son is going to live in order for the promise to be flown through him because the promise didn't say through a son the promise said through your son isaac mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so mm -hmm. if if god mm -hmm. is telling you to do something that seems so irrational you got to have faith that God wants you to do it throughout. And the idea is that Abraham was in every motion going to do it. He had every desire to do it mm. with the expectation <clears throat> that God's will is going to match what God's promise is. And that's the difference between us and God. Our, our will don't always match the promise that God has for us. Mm. But God's will always matches what the promise is that's a powerful word yeah. powerful word let me just jump in real quick uh not only in this aspect you have to also remember uh with uh hagar all that whole situation they've been sent away and so now how does abraham leave his household with isaac and not tell his wife that i'm mm. going to sacrifice mm. And I would call this the uh, the boundary of doubtless faith, mm. or better yet, a faith of doubt. Mm -hmm. How do I operate in my Christian experience 
when I know what God has told me to do does not make human sense, right. but yet I still do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what Abraham, Abraham had faith hinged in doubt, but the doubt was to believe that God would do it anyhow. Amen. And so mm -hmm. I challenge us today in our, in our experiences, no matter what we're going through, you know, there's no way your tuition bill got paid because you never had the money. There's no Come way on. the mortgage gets paid. Talk about it. It's not <laughs> there. I, I, I remember going an uh, extra 50 miles on no gas in a car. My goodness. And I'm doubting the whole way. Mm -hmm. But I'm like Abraham. God said go, and I've got to go. Mm. So we have to understand that this journey, the promise, starts with pro, P-R-O. God will provide. Amen. That's a good Amen. word. That's definitely a good word. And I know from the fact that we can we can get, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes look and I say, man, I don't know if I did that. Because right. <laughs> you just gave me a son. You just gave me the way out. And now you're trying to tell me exactly. to get rid of the you, way You're going to have to find another way. <laughs> That's right. That's mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but praise God, Abraham was able and to get that, through that. that. That is something else. Yeah. That is something else. Because hinged in just everything and now, we're looking at at least what 10 to 15 years after mm. Isaac is born, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That you're taking this journey, yeah, and what you thought was impossible 15 <laughs> years ago with Sarah, <laughs> right? Right, yeah, it, 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 it's it definitely impossible, definitely. But you, says all things are possible, amen. But you know what, Pastor so, Howard, I, I love what you're saying, and you just talking talking about Sarah, and that kind of leads us into Tuesday's lesson. Uh, where it talks about the death of Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, give us some insights, man of God, on, on this powerful portion of Abraham's story. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you, this, like I say, is a very personal, uh, pragmatic application, because uh, a few years ago, everybody, uh, mostly online, knows my experience. And so it's a challenge that you continue to produce and believe the promise of God when you go through this time period of losing a spouse. And the thing about it is that if you look at the context, uh, and I think it's divine appointment that even Rebecca is mentioned in the, the chapter before in the lineage, mm. as if to say, I, God says, I look here, I'm going to unpack this. And because you have some degree of doubt, I'm going to shore up your faith and let you know that I've already provided a wife for Isaac. Mm -hmm. Because one of the greatest goals and desires that a parent has is to make sure that child is established. And in this uh, uh, culture of Abraham's day, it was very important. That's why he made sure that that he, he had his uh, one of his servants to to promise to make a promise that a certain uh, 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 a Canaanite woman would not be the wife. For his son uh, Isaac mm. and so this lesson brings out a very important point not only does it talk about the context of how they go about the burial mm -hmm. and he's there and they wanted to give him the land and he said no I'm gonna pay for it and 400 pieces of shackle of silver and the reason being is that Abraham learned mm. that his, his <clears throat> entire journey was because of God and God alone he didn't want anybody to come back and say, well, Abraham got where he is because I did this, or I did that. He learned even in the midst of sorrow and sadness to trust mm -hmm. God 100%. Mm -hmm. And he also knew that the greater picture is that Christ, the Messiah, a type that Isaac was, would be coming. And that he would see his lovely Sarah once again. Mm. But he had to have that faith. And he had to go through that mourning period. And it lets us know that we can make it to the other side. Because that's part of the promise. The promise involves death because of sin. But also the promise involves a resurrection mm. because of Jesus. Amen. So let's look to the other side. Amen. Amen. I like to comment. Um, I, I'm actually going to latch on to something that Elder Howard said as we go into Wednesday. And and the thing is, um, you remember growing up, you know, many people, whether you grew up in the Adventist church or a non-denominational church or some type of church, you know that there were parents that were plotting on who their kids were married. 
they, mm-hmm. they, they were trying to hook their kids up with some one of my best friends in life right now. The first three, four years of our relationship were so weird because my dad and her mother was trying to put us together. Mm. Well, that's what we find in in lesson and in, 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 in the Wednesday's lesson where because Abraham knew and trusted in God, he wanted to ensure that his son was set up for success when it comes to the promise that God had for them. Mm -hmm. So there were certain stipulations that were put there and and making sure that he doesn't marry this type of woman and that he marries a specific type of woman. And it had to be a union. It had to be a mutual understanding on every side. And one of the things that I found very interesting, uh, all the participants in the party, uh, in the party of the marriage arrangement for Isaiah, I mean, uh, uh, for Isaac uh, acted in faith. Abraham acted in accordance with God's uh, promise and refused to consider a wife for Isaac among those who did not know and worship the true God. Uh, Eleazar trusted that God would send his angel before, that's in Genesis 24, 7, and, uh, before him and would make clear who Isaac should marry. Isaac, just as he had done on Mount Moriah, because think about it, Isaac was younger and stronger and probably more well built than his father he could have easily overtaken his father i mean i don't think we think about that he could have easily overtaken his father but he submitted to his father's will that's a lesson for us we ought to submit to our father our heavenly father's will but isaac just as he done on mount moriah isaac again trusted his life into the hands of abraham in faith that God's promise are true. And Rebecca, she consented to join herself to Isaac, uh, um, see uh, Isaac's sight unseen in an incredible act of faith on her part. Everyone in the participant, everyone that participated in this union showed that they trusted God. But here's the thing that I want to leave us with. This is the thing that came to mind for us. And, you know, if you want to dialogue, if you want to put it in the chat, what comes to mind, Here's the ultimate thing that comes to mind, not just for this situation, but how does that relate to us now? There's two things. Number one, each one of us has a promise within our lives that will work best with whom God chooses for us. That is to say that some people want to choose their own spouse. Um, That may not align to the ultimate will that God has for you. God's plan will maximize the blessing and maximize the promise that he has for you should you choose and not choose but should you allow yourself to link on to his will Mm. so again each one of us has a promise within our own lives that will work best with whom god chooses for us and the second thing is this is a lesson for us that god cares about whom we we link up with in marriage Mm. Again, Mm -hmm. God cares about who we link up with in marriage. There's some people that get married to someone and that person takes away from what God wants them to do. But then there's other people that when you see them together, you can tell that God linked both of them together because of how tremendous of the impact they have for each other. What's your thoughts on that? Do you think that in this lesson we can actually pay attention to how we are um, when we're doing marriage counseling or when we're encouraging people with whom they should marry, that God really cares about who they marry. Oh yeah, powerful, powerful word. And what you stated, it's been shown throughout history in the Bible, in current time, so many times relationships are forged together and it may not be Christ-centered. And there are some, and let me be very clear, there are some that you can have marriages and and, and they will sometimes work out. You can even have two of the same faith and the marriage may not work out. Mm -hmm. But you give yourself a better opportunity for growth and marriage, I call it marriage maturity, where you grow together. Mm. It's when the Bible says, can two walk together? Unless they what? Agree. So there's some basic foundations that need to take place in our Christian experience if we're going to grow in the character of Christ. Amen.
I think when I look at this, I mean, also, yeah, go ahead, definitely. Um, and just to piggyback off of what Pastor Howard and Pastor Monty said, um, when when I look at the story of Abraham, I see I see growth. By the mm -hmm. time you get to um, the marriage of Isaac, um, Abraham's servant, when he goes to find Rebecca, he's even praying to God to make his journey successful. Yes, um, it seems like his whole household is falling in line with um, the divine. Mm -hmm. And so when when the parents are, are are following the Lord, and when the household is following the Lord then the the marriage can be can be successful by his grace because the lord what the lord is joined together mm. let no man tear asunder i just see a progression <clears throat> through the text of the household becoming a household of faith yeah and that leads to isaac marrying the right person yeah. pastor bohanna that's an excellent point man you just stole my thunder i was going to just talk about how there's prayer that was permeating in through the text there man yeah. but you just stole it doc you just stole it <laughs> but yeah i, I mean from spirit. from my perspective yeah the holy spirit man revealed that to you it's not flesh and blood but when i look at this man i i i just see that we probably not that we probably we should be in more prayer even in the, the good, the great things in life in terms of, you know, finding a wife, finding a husband, a spouse, mm -hmm. connecting who we're going to connect ourselves with in business or in, in education, things of nature. But also we, we just need to be prayerful, man. And we and if we can get ourselves in a prayerful mindset and get our household in a prayerful mindset, as, as Pastor Bohannon already said, mm -hmm. you know, God is going to reveal things to us. God's going to put us on the right path, allow us to to kind of move forward in his will. And I think the biggest, the second biggest thing here that Sabbath School lesson makes is about making sure that we have free will to choose mm -hmm. if we want to follow God's will or we want to make our own way. Yeah. And inside of this story, we see Abraham, we see Eleazar, we see, you know, you know, uh, uh, Isaac, we see uh, even Rebecca, we see them all following God's will and just coming together. And that's just a powerful thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go ahead and, and, and drop it over to you, Elder Palmas, for, for Thursday, if you will, and kind of take us through that story. Man, Thursday, there are so many points. First of all, just do me a favor, whatever platform you're watching this on, just drop us a comment below in the chat section. Let us know if you're enjoying this study or not, right? Go ahead and just let us know how this specific lesson is blessing you or not blessing you, right? Leave whatever comment uh, you have below and we'll make sure we shout you out and put that on the screen. Thursday's lesson, y'all, is... Um, a, a, it's a bit bittersweet uh, because we, we, we come to, uh, we're nearing the end of Abraham's journey, right? Um, there are a couple of key points that I just want to highlight here in, in Thursday's lesson where it talks about a wife for Abraham, Sarah, the love of his life, his boo. Unfortunately, she, she passes away, right? A lot of people let their promise die with the person in their life that died. That's, that we, we see this, unfortunately, a part of ministry and, and, and pastoral ministry, man, is we have to do a lot of funerals. We, we, we conduct a lot of, of funerals and memorial services, and, and I've seen on so many different occasions where when that loved one falls asleep for whatever reason, sickness, you know, a car accident, whatever it is, uh, where the one left behind is grieving so much. They're like, I don't know how I'm going to live life anymore. I don't know how I'm going to, to survive. All right. Um, there's a couple things. The first thing, watch this, y'all, is, is um, there's still a promise on your life. And as long as you and I have breath in our body, that promise is going to come to pass. Now, people stop. People stop and say, okay, uh, Dr. Scott, you know, uh, Isaac is born, mm -hmm. so that's it. That's the promise. The promise is over, right? The promise is over. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Abraham might as well just die because the promise is over. <laughs> that's it. But we see that there is more to the story, which means if there's more to the story, could it be that there was more to the promise? All right. So so the first thing I want to share is is th is this God's promise, first and foremost, is not bound to your age, because the promise that we talk about all the time is Abraham was 100 years old. Right. Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. But yet here it is in this lesson. It's talking about a wife for Abraham. Right. So God's promise isn't bound to age because uh, God is still blessing Abraham well after Isaac was born. 
right? So there's more to your story. I just want to challenge somebody who's watching me right now who, think that all, who thinks that all hope is lost. There's no more uh, uh, to, to you. I'm telling you there is more in front of you than there is behind you. Mm. God is not finished writing your story. If God promised you life, we're in a season right now, fellas, where mental health is, is, is that's kind of like the new buzzword right? But people are struggling right now in their minds and they're thinking that they're going to die. We just came out of one of the worst periods that we've all ever lived through in this pandemic, right? The, I, I believe the Biden administration just last week said that we have crossed over a million deaths, right? And because of this mental health crisis, one of the things that, that I'm seeing as I counsel and coach people are people are thinking they're about to lose their life. Mm. But I'm here today to tell you that there's a promise on your life. God promised Abraham that he would live to a good, ripe age, right? And so if God has promised you life, don't let the news distract you, the media distract you, don't let what's going on in your life, don't let the doctor's diagnosis distract you. What God has for you is for you. Now, here's the other thing that I found in, in Thursday's lesson. There's a lot of nuggets, so stay here with me real quick. Even though the blessing, y'all, was through Isaac, the promise was through all the kids. Okay, y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. All right, say it again. Hey, say it. Say it again. I gotta say it again. Okay. Talk to me. So the blessing was through Isaac, but the promise was that I was that Abraham would be the father of many nations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so I'm, I, I love words. I I communicate for a living as we all do, right? So so let's break down the word many. I was always taught growing up that if you have one it's single. Mm. If you have two, it's a couple, right? Mm. If you have three, it's a few. A few, yeah. If you have four, it's some. Mm. And five or more means many. Mm. So check it. Now. The first All son right. was Ishmael, right? Abraham was about what? Uh, uh, 80 some years old, 86, somewhere around there when Ishmael was born. Well, that's one son. That doesn't equal many nations, Dr. Scanius. Mm. Ish, uh, uh, Isaac, Isaac, the blessing, but that's just two sons. Mm -hmm. That don't mean many nations. Well, if we read in Genesis 25, there were six other sons born to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Six more sons. Well, now, if we sing the song, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham, right? We're not talking about uh, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all that lineage. We're talking about many sons. God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And so what that says to me, though, even though the love of his life had died, God says, I'm going to bless you with another wife. And, and, you know, some scholars think that Keturah, his new wife, was actually Hagar. We're not going to get into those semantics right now. Somebody say, oh, let me go back to Facebook and see what my old flame is doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, well, but, watch it, preacher. Come on. Okay. I don't want to bowl down, down, down your alley too, too much, somebody. Right? Right? But what that says to me is God's promise is going to come to pass no matter what happens in your life. I know the loss that you've experienced, my brother and my sister, is devastating, but the promise on your life is still the promise on your life. And so we can't just stop with Isaac, the, the blessing. We have to go with the promise. Mm -hmm. The promise was you are going to die at a good, ripe age. The other promise was, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Mm -hmm. And so Abraham, after the loss of his boo, is blessed with another yeah. wife, right? So the first thing is, number one, the promise is not bound to your age. Number two, if God said it, that settles it. So he's blessed, Abraham is, with six other sons to Keturah, Hagar, like whoever this new wife was, right? Here's the other point that I want to share, uh, and then I want to spark some dialogue here. Don't be quick to judge somebody for getting remarried after they experience a major loss. Like, we want to talk practical here. I'm dubbed the practical preacher, right? We see this all the time. Somebody, um, they lose their husband, they lose their wife, and they get remarried, right? Or they get into a relationship right after that, and we judge them. Oh, I can't believe you doing this. How you going? Yo, 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 your spouse ain't even in the ground warm yet or whatever, and, and you with somebody else. Think about this thing. People have been with somebody for over half their life. Mm. 
Companionship is a normal part of our human existence. Remember, it was the original promise, God, who said in earlier Genesis, it's not good that people be alone, right? And so God knows this and he says, boom, Abraham, I know the love of your life is falling asleep, but I'm blessing you with somebody else because there's still another promise I got to fulfill through you. So don't judge people just because they get in another relationship right after that. Now, as a coach, counselor, I would tell people, try to make sure you're healed first and don't just jump in with anybody, but it's okay for you to want, those are normal feelings for you to want to be with somebody. Companionship is, is, is a, it goes into that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a normal thing for you to have that, right? I see that Abraham, the Bible says, was comforted with Keturah. So was Isaac. Isaac was mourning the loss of his mom. He found Rebekah, and the Bible says that, that Isaac was comforted with Rebekah's companionship mm. after the loss of his mom. So companionship is good. Now, here's the practical advice I want to give you. If you're jumping into a relationship with somebody after you've experienced a major loss, whether that is the death of a spouse, whether that is the divorce, right? Because a lot of people in this pandemic now, post-pandemic, are dealing with divorce and separation, right? And that, that's a huge thing in our society. And Christians, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we are not uh, immune to that, to those challenges. So if you're dealing with that loss, make sure the companionship you're seeking is somebody who's going to comfort you and not bring chaos to your life. Mm. We just talked about that a little bit ago. The person you marry, Dr. Sconiers, can probably impact where you spend eternity. That's right. That's right? right. So make sure that if you're seeking companionship, it's all good. That's fine to do that. Do it on your own time. Right. That's between you and God. Just make sure it is a comforting companionship and not a chaotic type of companionship oh, yeah. and then the last and, thing and, come come yeah jump 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 in and, uh, and i think what you're saying is very valid and very practical and what i also just add very quickly in this last uh two five, seconds five minutes. lesson yeah is that god is multitasking yeah he is providing for isaac and abraham mm -hmm. and the core of that is relationship mm -hmm. yeah and companionship yeah and so no matter what we're going through God has us, he has the promise, and he will bring us through to the other side. And guess what? Not only will he bring us through, but he'll bring our children through. Amen. Come on. And so many times we are complex, we are despaired because we see our children going this way or that way. Mm -hmm. But the promise is that if we just give them to God, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're old, they will, it will not depart. The, they may lead or lean, I'd say, to the other side, but the truth is always in them. And yeah. like that prodigal, the prayers of a righteous person will bring them back home. That's Amen. good. That's good. Amen. I love the fact, man, we talked about it for yeah. a minute, and I know we only have about three minutes left. But I love the fact that, as you were just saying, Pastor Howard, uh, about our kids, because Isaac was mourning, too. It was, this was his mom, right? We just got finished celebrating Mother's Day. Mom is gone. Abraham said, I need you to find a specific person for my son, right? Mm -hmm. What that says to me is we need to start praying specific prayers over our kids. Mm -hmm. Mainly, watch this, let's start praying for our children's future spouses even now. Yeah. Come on, what you think about that? Amen, Thanks, amen, definitely, definitely. I think what it comes down to is that we need to understand that, uh, you know, God's timing is not our timing. And not only is that true, but, you know, we are creatures who we want to have companionship. We want to have fellowship and we need to have individuals that are capable of coming to our aid when we find ourselves down. I know that Isaac and, and also Abraham were probably, you know, devastated to lose, you know, their spouse and their mom. But I know I was devastated when I lost a parent in my life. I can't imagine losing losing my wife right yeah. so but at one point it's clear is that we all have a come across and all we need someone to come and lift us up mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a form of a companion there's someone in, in the form of a of spouse or even friendships or mm -hmm. churches or fellowship that's and want to make sure is that people grieve that we are definitely touching the right place Absolutely. that's going to wrap it up for us this evening i mean sorry this afternoon uh, we are great it's been a great sabbath school lesson with you we talk about the promise we went through a lot we've seen how abraham was able to uh, maneuver and and go through through the possibility of losing Isaac and then continue on his faith, even to find uh, Isaac a wife. And we're just greatly blessed from the lesson uh, this morning. Before we go, we want to say a congratulations to all the graduates, whether you're graduating from middle school, 
elementary school, high school, or college, we congratulate you. Well done. Good job. And we want to send out our blessings to all the individuals from the South Atlantic Conference. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Well, well hang on. One more thing. Just before we dismiss, I, 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 I'd be remiss if we did not acknowledge those who lost their lives in, temp, in, in that, that unfortunate terroristic act. Um, and grocery store shooting. So we just want you to know that, that your church family is praying with you. We're praying for all of the families involved. Um, I know this is a tragic time for you, so we honor you if you need us as a church family. I know we're all the way in the southern part of the states and you guys are in the northern part of the state. If you need us, reach out, but just know that we are praying with you and for your families. Amen. Amen. And again, thank you everybody. And let me just remind all the parents that this afternoon we have children's church from uh, 4 to 5 p.m. right here. Just go to South Atlantic's website, register your children uh, ages uh, 0 to 12 for a powerful children church experience online. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the South Atlantic Conference Church where we serve as Christ. I pray that you will receive a blessing from all that you hear and see today. But before we pray, I just wanted to let you know that today is Adventurer World Day 2022. Our adventurer ministry are our children from ages four to nine. And we are training them up to be our leaders of tomorrow. And so I'm just going to say that you would please support one of our local adventure ministries today. And thank you so much for joining us here at South Atlantic Conference. May you receive a blessing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for another Sabbath that you have brought us to. We thank you for bringing us through the week. We thank you for supplying all of our needs according to your riches. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, that you would draw near to those who are sick, those who are hurting, and those who are wanting. Father, we pray that you would just bless the speakers and everyone who has a part in this service today and that we will all receive a blessing. Thank you so much for hearing and for answering our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. This song says, Save the Savior. Do not pass me by. Here we go. Pass me not. Me not, O oh gentle spirit. Hear my humble cry.
sing that last verse and that last chorus like this baby we got last time asking the Lord to do anything for us. He is the spring of all my comfort. Let's sing that last verse together. Thou the spring of all my comfort. Good morning. It is now prayer time here at the South Atlantic Conference as we share this divine worship experience. And we know uh, many have added in the chat room different prayers. Uh, and we want to just take this time as we lift up each and every family, uh, especially to those that are going through the tragic loss in California, as well as in Buffalo, New York, and other areas. We lift those families up in prayer. Let's look to the Lord now. Kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you for your grace and how you have kept us all this week. So, Father, if it had not been for the Lord who was on the outside, where would we be? So, Heavenly Father, we come and we thank you, first of all, for keeping us safe as we continue to transverse through this pandemic community. We also, Heavenly Father, just lift up those families in uh, Buffalo, New York, and from the tragedy, that mass shooting, and also in California and other parts of our world, and also Ukraine and the challenges they are facing in that war. Lord, we know that you're soon to come. So, Father, we pray a special prayer. Uh, for friends and families that are going through difficult times, whether financial, whether sickness. Lord, we know that you are the healer. You are the provider. And so now, oh, Heavenly Father, we continue to lift up Sister Makita Mosley and her family as they continue to meander through the grief process. We also lift up Sister Peggy Ballard. We ask for healing on her behalf. We thank you for what you've already done and what you are doing in her life. And then, Father, we pray for those that are in the graduation season, whether in kindergarten or whether in the eighth grade or high school or college or post-college. Uh, we know that 
at, it's difficult at times to to grasp all of these educational things, but you have allowed us to make it through. So, Father, we ask a blessing upon all of our graduates. We thank you for them. We thank you for their parents and grandparents in a special way. And then, Father, we can either lift up our speaker of the hour. We know that you have been with him before, and, Father, you're going to bless us again today. So in the name of Jesus, we ask for anointing upon his life and the message that we will receive. And most of all, Father, we ask that you would just lead, guide, and comfort us. Yea, do we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with us. So, Father, we thank you for our conference administration. We thank you for our leadership. And we ask, O oh, Heavenly Father, continued guidance and direction upon each and every church, not only in the South Atlantic Territory, but throughout the United States and North American Division and Canada. But not only there, Lord, we pray throughout the entire world and the General Conference and our ministry as we seek and try to help save others for the kingdom of God. Bless, we pray, and we thank you, and bless all of our schools, and we thank you for another prosperous year in Christian education. We pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. Have you ever thought about the reason why we worship God? While there are many answers to this question, think about how wonderful it is to worship God simply for the fact that first is where he belongs. The opening words of the Holy Scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, positions him as the first without other details about his origin and prior existence. His position as the first is more than an honorific or a static title. It's a divine statement of God as the starter of everything. In Paul's words, he is the chief cornerstone. And for John the Revelator, he is the Alpha. As the appeal, put God first, resounds in our ears, it'd be silly to think that we can decide whether or not God is first. Putting God first means to acknowledge who God is the first, the starter. And when we put him first, we're aligning our existence with the order of the universe. Our two brothers were holding and pulling the same piece of the puzzle game while screaming at each other. One wanted to place the piece at the bottom left and the other at the top right. The father who just stepped into the room could not refrain from smiling and finally gave these words of advice. Unless the piece is placed where it should be, you will never complete the puzzle. Unless the first, the starter, is placed where he is supposed to be, our existence will never be complete. We are doomed to be non-starters. In managing our resources, small and great, who and what is competing for the first place? If you wish to make this year a masterpiece of your life, choose now to acknowledge God as the first in everything praising Him for being the great starter of the universe. As you worship Him with your tithe and promise, invite Him to be first in your life and first in the management of your resources. In Him, we have a great start and a strong finish. May we put our desires last and God first. There's no God like Jehovah, amen, amen.
store And these are the days of great trial A famine in darkness since war But we are the voice in the desert crying Prepare ye the way of the Lord Everybody say me Holy Good morning and happy Sabbath. I bid you greetings for the New Gainesville and Voice of Hope District. My name is Pastor John Sconiers. It's a blessing to be here with you this morning. I want to thank the administration for inviting me, and I just look forward to God blessing us. Amen. Let's go directly to the word. Today we're going to come from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. The word of God says in Genesis chapter 32, 22 through 32. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the fork of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook and sent them over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. 
But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. I'd like to speak to you just a moment from the context or subject of thanking God for survival. Thanking God for survival. Will you pray with me? Father, in the midst of everything we go through throughout our lives, Lord, even just this week, we just want to say thank you for survival. We ask that the word that goes out today will bless your people and that be used, Lord, to edify us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, as you remember, Jacob has a fraternal twin brother by the name of Esau. Jacob and Esau are clear examples of a sibling rivalry. As a matter of fact, their struggle with each, with each other begins before they're even born. The Bible says that while they are both in their mother Rebecca's womb, they are fighting to see which will will come out first. Because the older will inherit all of Isaac's estate, which Isaac inherited from Abraham. And this is the entire state of the promised land or that of Canaan. They are fighting one another and Esau is born first. Jacob is holding on to Esau's heel and there is no time delay in their birth, but the order is clear and they turn out to be different as night and day. Esau is not an honor roll student, nor the sharpest tool in the woodshed, but Esau is an alpha male and knows how to fight and hunt. He is a warrior beloved by Isaac. Jacob, on the other hand, is a mama's boy. Jacob can't hunt. He can't fight, but he's smart and tries to talk himself out of everything. One day, Jacob even talks Esau to selling his birthright for a bowl of soup, and Esau falls for it. But things come to a head when Isaac is on his deathbed. Isaac is getting ready to die, and it's his custom to pass on the blessing to the oldest son who will inherit all of the estate. Isaac calls Esau to his side and tells Esau, I want to bless you. Go and fix my favorite meal. Esau goes out to hunt and kill so he can provide his father's favorite meal. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, sees that Esau is gone and she goes to the freezer and pops something into the microwave and tells Jacob, take this to Isaac so that he can bless you. Pretend to be Esau. Jacob shows up with a hot meal, pretending to be, us, pretending to be Esau, and Isaac is deceived. Isaac blesses Jacob with all of his inheritance. Esau, who rightly should have it, shows up and finds out what takes place or what has happened. Esau makes a promise that day that if it's the last thing he's going to do, he will kill Jacob. Right after the mourning period for Isaac, Rebekah realizes that Esau is serious and tells Jacob to go, run away. And after your brother comes down and it's safe to come back, I'm going to send for you. So Jacob runs. He lives with Laban and acquires two wives. Then Laban kicks him out, and now Jacob has only one place to go, back to Canaan where Esau is waiting. Jacob, being the slickster he is, tries to send Esau a peace offering. Jacob is thinking, maybe I can buy Esau off. Jacob sends his livestock and his gold, even his wives and children, hopeful that Esau sees the prosperity of his family, that Esau will be okay. The Bible says that when Esau gets Jacob's offering, he gathers 400 men to go look for Jacob. Esau hasn't forgotten about what has transpired or what has taken place. And now Jacob is left alone. His family is gone. His possessions are gone. And nighttime comes. And the Bible says a man shows up to wrestle with Jacob. Not any man, not Ray Ray from the block, but God. And the Bible is intentional in showing this is God who has come in human form. And God has disguised himself. God shows up in human form to wrestle with Jacob. And as we skip to the end, usually, you know, we, we like to skip to the end of this context, the end of these verses and get to the point where Jacob says, I won't let go until you bless me. But we end up missing a few things. 
God shows up at night to wrestle. God shows up at night and starts a fight. God shows up at night to lay hands on somebody. And there is no immediate reason or explanation given. But God shows up and fights. It's not because Jacob has done something wrong. It's not because Jacob needs to be punished. It's not because Jacob called on God. However, God shows up at night to fight. And this is not a God that we're used to seeing. You know, I like the God that shows up and says, I've heard your cry and I've come to deliver you. I like the God that shows up and says, let me walk you through the valley of the shadows of death. I like the God that shows up and says, come unto me all that are labor and are heavy burden and I will give you rest. But that's not the God we encounter here in this text. This God shows up and all he wants to do is wrestle. God shows up at night with no immediate reason and starts a fight. Who among us hasn't encountered this God? Where for no discernible reason, you find yourself in a struggle with no explanation as to why God would let you go through the issue you're going through. You're seemingly alone, all by yourself, and a struggle we weren't expecting commences. Alone in the darkness of our lives, missing the creature comforts, with stuff in our mind, and then we're engaged in a fight that we didn't expect. God comes in darkness, disguised as a man while Jacob is asleep. This leaves Jacob to wrestle with the uncertainty of who or what this really is. Here is God who initiates a season of uncertainty. Who hasn't wrestled with God? Truth be told, there have been moments in your life where you are absolutely uncertain about what God wanted, where you were going or where your life was heading. God doesn't always make his will crystal clear. Even the most faithful of God had at some point in time walked in uncertainty. Now, God, disguised as a man, comes to fight and wrestle with Jacob. But then something interesting happened. The word of God says that God realizes he couldn't prevail against Jacob. God realized that he can't win. God realized that he can't overpower Jacob. And I look at that and I say, wait, that's not the God that I know. My God can move mountains. My God can speak and the sea will be still. My God can heal disease with just a touch of his garment. My God can have no every enemy in your life. But here is a God who picks a fight with Jacob and can't prevail. So when God realizes that he can't win the fight that he's picked, God breaks Jacob's hip. God broke a hip because he couldn't win a fight. Why does God break Jacob's hip? Why does God resort to a tactic that inflicts harm? Why does God cause Jacob to limp for the rest of his life? How can a compassionate, loving God touch us in ways that break us? Has God ever broken you? You know, I prefer a God who, who heals me. I prefer a God who encamps all around me. I prefer a God who covers me with a cloud by day and fire by night. But here we find a God that breaks hips. Why does God break Jacob's hip? Why does God break us in life? I'm going to suggest to you three reasons why. And then we're going to get out of here and get on with our Sabbath lunch. Amen. The first reason why I believe that God breaks Jacob's hip and why God breaks us in life is to get us to submit and surrender. In order to get this, you have to ask yourself, what kind of fight can God get into and not prevail? What kind of struggle could divinity engage with humanity and humanity get the best of God? What kind of battle can you be in with God and you stand toe to toe with God? What struggle is there in life where God does not always prevail and there is only one? And this is a struggle to surrender our will to God's will and our ways to God's ways. See, we are made with free will and free choice. All of us can be like Adam and choose to disobey God's will. We can choose to go left when God says to go right. We can choose to go when God says stop. We can choose to be stubborn as a mule when it comes to obeying God and choosing God. We can choose to live life on our own terms. We can choose to plot our own way and disregard what God wants for us. And many of us, myself included, stand toe to toe with God and sometimes find ourselves disobedient. 
But God knows life outside of his will is not what's best for you. Life and disobedience to his command and his will leads to death and destruction and this life and the next. God knows that you can live outside of his will and he loves you too much not to use everything within his power, not to get you to surrender your will. God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son. And God loves you so much that he says, let me try everything I can, including the kitchen sink, to get him to see that I love him or her and they should follow my will. Why does God break Jacob hip? Why does God break us? Because God is God and he has to break your hip to get you to surrender and stop fighting him. That is exactly what he is going to do. God says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to attempt to get you on the right path. We serve a God who if blessing you doesn't change your life. He has enough love to break you in the right place to get you to surrender and declare, I'm not going to fight you anymore. I'm going to surrender my will to your will, God. And when God breaks Jacob's hip, Jacob is no longer fighting with God. He's just holding on to God. Now that I've been broken, I'm not fighting. Now that I've been broken, I'm not struggling. Now that I've been broken, all I can do is hold on to whatever it is you're going to do or have for me, Lord. And I wish that there there was someone who could shout an affirmation that you have struggled against the will of God. You took jobs that God did not tell you to take. You have bought cars and houses that God did not lead you to buy. You have walked down roads that God did not order and God had to stay step in and break you in the right place. And when the Lord broke you or took things from you or allowed you to struggle, that's when you gave up the battle, fell on your knees and said, Lord, have your way. I wonder if there's anyone today sitting in your homes, in your churches, and you're wondering uh, and you're saying the Lord broke me at just the right place. Did the Lord have to break you? The Lord have to strip you? The Lord have to take anything from you? And now all you do is to cling on to God. He breaks us to get us to submit and surrender. Truth be told, We don't surrender when we see the light. We surrender when we feel the heat. If God loved us enough to sacrifice his son on the cross of Calvary, then surely God loves us enough to break us when we need it. And at the beginning of the breaking, God doesn't let you go, uh, doesn't let doesn't let go of you when you're outside of his will. He says, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to place you in situations So where you can decide for yourself that I'm going to follow the will of God. Why does God break us? Why did God break Jacob's hip? He does it so that we can surrender our will. Point number two. Sometimes God breaks us or God has broken Jacob's Jacob's hip because he wants to deepen Jacob's and our desire for God. Now, look at the story. God shows up as a man, not as a God. After all, who would wrestle or have enough nerve to wrestle with God? God comes in the form of a man at night. Now, remember, Jacob has sent all his family and his servants and his possessions on ahead. Esau is coming with 400 men. Jacob is nervous and he's trying to go to sleep. And in his sleep, somebody jumps on him. So who does Jacob think this might be that he's wrestling with at night? It's Esau. Jacob believes this is Esau. And God is not playing fair here. Jacob is probably thinking, God, you came upon me like I expected Esau. I was expecting to sound down, shine down light from heaven and announce yourself. I was expecting you to come in great thunderous voice. God, I was expecting you to descend with your splendor. But you just came at me in the middle of the night to wrestle. Why does God show up as a man? In chapter eight of Genesis, God showed up to Jacob and Jacob didn't even know God was there. Jacob couldn't tell that he was with God. Jacob is at Bethel, Beth meaning house of, El meaning God. The Lord speaks to Jacob and Jacob wakes up in chapter 28, verse 16 and says, I was with God in the place of God and didn't even know it. It's a shame to be in God's presence and not know it. Fast forward and Jacob believes that he is wrestling a man until his hip is broken. Jacob realized that a man cannot touch his hip and break it. He believes that this is not a man, but God. 
And when Jacob understands who he is, who it is that he's wrestling with and his hip is broken, Jacob says, if you're going to break me, then you have to bless me. If there is a breaking that takes place, there has to be a blessing. And when God breaks, there must be a blessing in it somewhere. God wouldn't take me through this and not bless me. God didn't take me this far. There needs to be a blessing. Jacob requests a blessing. What does Jacob request? Jacob didn't request or want things. Jacob didn't request or want Esau's birthright. Jacob didn't request or want Isaac's inheritance. Jacob didn't request or want Rachel's hand in marriage. But now when it comes to be blessed, he asked God's name. He asked God's name in the same way that Moses asked God's name in Exodus chapter three. Jacob is hungry for God in ways he didn't, uh, 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 he wasn't hungry for God before. In every breaking, there's a hunger to get to know God better. Why does God break Jacob? Why does God break us? So that we may submit and surrender. And secondly, to deepen our desire for God. Third and the final thing I'm going to leave you with is God breaks Jacob's hip and God sometimes breaks us for a change of character. Why does God break us sometimes? For a change of character. Notice God asked Jacob what his name was and Jacob replies. God says, I don't really like that name. The name Jacob means supplanter, deceiver, trickster. I want to give you a new identity. I want to give you a new character. I want to give you a new name. And that name is Israel. God broke Jacob to birth Israel, one who struggles with God or an heir or prince of God. The name and character went from deceiver to heir of God. The breaking that Jacob uh, that, that, that Jacob meant was was meant to give birth to a new identity. The breaking that you're going through is meant to give you a new identity and a new birth. That breaking you're going through is meant to give you a different character or a change of character or a change of characteristics. That breaking you're going through is to make you better than what you were. God can break you and change you in a way that makes you better than who you were. Jacob is a calm man touched by God, a trickster who's seen God face to face, a liar that couldn't identify God, but now held on to him. The difference is who you were and who you're going to be in God. Anybody go through something and now with God can look back and say, praise God, I've been changed and not what I used to be. God says you are Israel because you have wrestled and prevailed. But Israel prevails over Jacob. Who you will be is greater than who you were. And what I'm going to do is take you through this breaking so that you will be greater because your Israel Israel will be greater than your Jacob. I want you to get something else. I want you to have a name change. I want you to be unique. And so God says, I need to take you from Jacob, that deceiver, that trickster, the fast talker to Israel, one who prevails with God, one who is an heir of God. When God changes the name, uh, that's the only name that individuals go by. Abraham's name is changed to Abraham and nobody calls him Abram. Sarai's name becomes Sarah. Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. But here Jacob is changed to Israel. But there's still a few moments in the Bible where Israel is still identified as Jacob. Why? Because everybody has an Israel with some Jacob tendencies. There are some of us that have some tendencies from our Jacob era. Now, here's a shout. When God identifies himself and says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. When your Jacob shows up, I'm still your God. When you're not everything you ought to be, I'm still going to be your God. When you slide back into your old ways, I'm still your God. When you're not acting right, I'm still your God. When you step outside my will, God's will, I'm still your God. When you're misbehaving, I'm still your God. Even when you're going through the breaking, even when you had a change of name, a change of characteristics, a change of, of, of your person in the name of God. And you find yourself slipping back. God says, I'm still your God. Let me leave this last thing with you. Not only does God break us 
because he wants to change our character, change our characteristics. Not only does God bless us, break us because he wants us to draw closer to him. Not only does God break us because he wants to surrender. But God breaks us so that we can learn to celebrate survival. Many times I look back over my life, I look back and I say, Lord, if it was not for you, I wouldn't have made it out. Lord, if you've not been by my side, things surely would have been worse. I should have died, but God kept me. And I'm grateful to have this limp. I should have been on a bad path, but God preserved me. And I thank God for this limp. Victory is no longer in beating someone, but living through the hard times, living through the breaking. And I can bless God today with empty hands. I can bless God today with a broken pocketbook. I can bless God today with a hoopty in the driveway because I survived and I'm here to celebrate. Is there anybody here that can say, God, I thank you for the breaking. I thank you for applying pressure in my life. I thank you for not letting all the circumstances in my life be good. Is there anybody here that can struggle but still rejoice in survival? Anybody that says, Lord, uh, I've had some issues, but you preserved me. You've kept me. You've held on to me. Anybody can say in the midst of COVID, you kept me. In the midst of health issues, financial issues, marital relationship problems, that you have kept me and can celebrate even in the midst because you survived. Let me tell you something. We serve an awesome God, a God who will do anything within his power to save us. A God with anything in his power to say, come and follow my will because I know what's best for you. And right now today, we ought to be thankful for survival. We ought to be thankful that a shooter didn't come into the, the, the store that you were at. We ought to be thankful that COVID didn't have you uh, uh, on your back in a hospital on a ventilator and dying. We ought to be thankful that you still have a job, thankful that you still have a car, thankful that you still have food in your stomach. Thankful that God has placed a hedge of protection around you. No matter what you're going through, we should be thankful. And Jacob is able to celebrate because he's thankful for survival, and we should too. Will you pray with me? Father God, we just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for our survival. Lord, we don't always follow your will. We don't always surrender ourselves, Lord. And sometimes you have to apply the pressure to us, Lord. But when the chips are down, we find ourselves on the other end and we're wrestling with you, God, and we're, we're in that uncertain point in our lives. We just want to thank you, God, right now for survival. And we ask, Father, for you to bless us in the midst of our breaking, that we may have a change of character, a change of heart, that we may draw closer unto you, Father. And when it's all said and done, we'll give you all the power, the praise, and all the glory. In the name of God, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I owe can praise you enough even if I try cause you've been so good come on so you've been you've been so good so good you've been you've been so good so good to me Lord, you are. 
so good You've been so good 